Today we'll hear from Dr. Ursula Sansom Daly. Did I get it right? And uh, she, she's a postdoctoral fellow and lecturer at the School of Women's and Children's Health at the University of New South Wales uh, Medicine and the University of New South Wales, Sydney. She's the Deputy Head of Behavioural Sciences Unit at Children, Sydney Children's Hospital, the largest research unit dedicated to paediatric adolescent psycho-oncology in the Southern Hemisphere. Ursula is also the clinical psychologist for Sydney Youth Cancer Service, the leading clinical team in the treatment and care for adolescents and young adults aged 15 to 25 years with cancer in Sydney. Reflecting on her dual clinical and research roles, Ursula focuses on applying evidence-based psychological models and methods to understand and address mental health issues among adolescents and young adults with cancer. And we're just so delighted to have Dr. Ursula Sansom Daly here to talk to such an important topic. So please join me in making her welcome. Thank you to all of you for coming as well. It's a real pleasure to be here. So when I was thinking about what I wanted to be able to speak to you all about, I thought that this might be a perfect opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing, particularly in collaborating with wonderful partners in the community. So that's what I've decided to focus today's talk on. So, um, so today I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of our research team, the sort of work that we do across a number of themes, but I'd really like to focus in on two of our online interventions, Recapture Life and Cascade, look at what we've been doing on those interventions and also how we're moving to work with partners in the community and also have a discussion about how that's going and, and love to hear your thoughts as well. So my stomping ground is at the Kids Cancer Centre in Sydney Children's Hospital, which is one of the largest um, paediatric tertiary treatment centres in Sydney and, and probably Australia. We have 110 new diagnoses of childhood and adolescent cancer every year. And just an interesting note to give you a sense of our kind of population is that in one of our families, in one of our studies recently, we documented that our families live on average 239 kilometres from the hospital. So quite a large catchment area, though I'm sure that that's also something that you'd be quite familiar with over here in WA as well. It's an Australian issue, I suppose. Um, in terms of my clinical hat, I work at Sydney Youth Cancer Service, as was mentioned just then, and so many of you are probably familiar with the youth cancer services across Australia, but for those who aren't, it's an Australia-wide network of clinical services, um, primarily or basically all situated in city centres, um, and that work to treat adolescents and young adults 15 to 25 years with cancer and because of that age spread we're actually we need to work across the pediatric and adult sectors so myself together with my team there we actually are cross appointed across Sydney Children's Hospital and Prince of Wales Hospital to be able to serve patients on both sides. And so from wearing my research hat I work with the wonderful behavioural sciences unit which um, essentially is this large wonderful research group focusing on understanding the impact of child and adolescent cancer and also working to mitigate the impact um, that that has on young people and families as they go on to move their lives after cancer. So we have a number of research areas including mental health, cognition and education, health behaviours, ethics and genetics and also family systems and relationships. And really we're aiming to improve a number of different outcomes across the patient, the survivor and also their families. So that's resilience, maximising their potential and looking at healthier lifestyles as well and across all of our research we really try and do that um, in a way where we're ethically implementing um, sort of scalable feasible and evidence-based interventions to enhance the whole family's well-being. So this is kind of a bit of a diagram of what our team looks like. It's grown quite a bit over the past number of years. And we've we sort of developed in such a way that we now have a number of different streams to our research. And we, we organise ourselves that way so that we can focus on a number of different areas with a lot of... Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good focus on each area. So I lead this stream over here, which is the mental health research stream, and that team is really focused on understanding and exploring the psychological and mental health impacts of cancer, but also um, developing interventions to address those impacts. But we also have a team uh, focused on education and cognition, so that's related to things like school re-entry for kids after they've finished cancer treatment, social outcomes and educational outcomes. We've got an ethics and genetics team here, which is focused on understanding psychological 
psychosocial aspects of the burgeoning field of precision medicine and genomic medicine, so tailored medicines in this new um, age of genetics where we're understanding more and more about um, sort of targeted therapies. Um, and this stream here focused on the whole family, so not just thinking about the patient, but also parents, the, the whole nuclear family, siblings, grandparents, and moving outwards. And then this team here is really focused on the health behaviours, whether that's diet, exercise, and also health behaviours to do with young people following up their health care years after they've had cancer treatment, which is also really important. And so the two interventions I'll be focusing on today are Recapture Life and Cascade, um, which kind of fit nicely together as two online interventions, but target slightly different groups in the survivorship trajectory. So this is our team, just to, to kind of briefly show you. Um, it's sort of a bit hidden up the top, but Professor Claire Wakefield is our wonderful um, leader and director of the unit. Um, and then, you know, we've got a number of postdocs, including myself, leading each of the teams. Um, just highlight as well, Look, Dr. Lauren Collada works alongside me in, in um, leading the Cascade intervention. So the context in which all of this takes place really is the fact that childhood and adolescent cancer is really at its heart a success story. So if you look back to the 1950s, um, you know, childhood cancer wasn't something that young people survived back in those days. It was essentially a fatal diagnosis. Whereas if you look at, at, at all of these coloured lines across all different diagnoses, really the trajectory, it's been a quite a steep trajectory upwards. And in recent years, what we now have is many and most of the cancers having survival rates over 80%, which is amazing. What that means is that we have what you could almost call a survival epidemic. So there's a growing, growing and cumulatively growing group of young people who are surviving and living for decades to come with a history of cancer in their past. And what that means is that this, young, this group of young people, um, you know, about 90% of them will incur at some point in their future lives a life-altering and or a life-threatening um, late effect of that cancer and its treatment. So a late effect is really like a side effect that happens later. So... Um, this, give, this little diagram gives you a bit of a sense, but because young bodies are developing when we're throwing all these kind of quite um, toxic and gruelling cancer treatments at them, it means that there are a number of um, physical symptoms that can be affected by that cancer treatment. So the cancer treatment affects the cancer, but it can also have these other effects on all the, all the different organ systems. So, for example, um, and, and this depends on the type of cancer treatment, obviously, and our cancer treatments have gotten better at reducing some of those late effects, but it's still not perfect. Um, and so you can see there are a number of late effects. There can be sort of effects on the heart, heart damage later on. Certainly infertility is something that we know continues to be a really big issue for young people from cancer treatment. Um, you know, lung function and... In, of interest to us, particularly in our group, is the cognitive impacts and particularly the psychosocial impacts of cancer and its treatment as well. And I think important to note is that many of these effects um, can come up many years after cancer treatment. So there's been research from a number of groups, in, including our own, to show that even many years after cancer treatment, and particularly looking at some of the psychosocial effects and psychological effects as well, they can occur many years after treatment. So in some studies, they've you know, estimated about a quarter of young people and adolescents having um, clinically significant distress, including anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, and things like that. So really one of the things that we have tried to do in our group is actually focus interventions on that survivorship period after the cancer treatment is finished. So that will include these two interventions here that I'll talk about today, Recapture Life and Cascade, which are focused on addressing psychological aspects of cancer treatment after it's finished. But we've also focused on starting to develop a body of interventions that can address a number of those other effects as well. So Reconnect um, is one focused on that school and educational impact of cancer. So how do we help young people re-engage with school and, and sort of catch up after the many, many weeks and months of missed school? Um, after the fact. Reboot is a, a lovely intervention targeted towards parents of young people, um, younger kids rather, um, focused around their diet. So we know that during cancer treatment, young people um, have a lot of taste and smell changes as a direct result of the chemotherapies that they have to take. And so what we see is actually their diets are a lot poorer after they finish cancer treatment. Um, partly due to those taste and smell changes, partly due to parenting and, and kind of... Um, 
parenting food behaviour sort of changes as well. So Reboot aims to help them with the, that diet impact. And then Reengage aims to help disengaged survivors um, reconnect with their long-term follow-up care um, many years after cancer treatment because we know it's so vitally important that they are still getting that specialised, cancer-informed follow-up support even many years after cancer treatment's finished. And the other group that are... Uh, or the other population that our research group really tries to bear in mind as well is a group that we could consider the ultimate survivors of child and adolescent cancer, which is parents and families whose young person doesn't survive their illness. So overall, survival rates have have gone incredibly, um, have improved um, dramatically, which is an amazing achievement. But we still have a handful of young people, at least two children every week, who don't survive. And this is a really tricky thing that I think within the health system context, we still grapple to address properly. And those are families that are going to go on to live with that impact for the rest of their lives. Um, I have this image here because our wonderful bereavement coordinator at Sydney Children's Hospital has, has kind of referred to this as like staring into the sun, you know, the idea of your child dying. It's just so hard to do and, and, and really almost impossible. But it's really important that we, we do look so that we can help those families as well. So our work has been funded um, over the past number of years through a wonderful program grant um, supported by Cancer Council New South Wales and from the Harry McPaul family. And this program grant has been focused around driving research across all stages of the translational research um, continuum. So really trying to, you know, still be engaging in that important discovery research to quantify and understand the nature of problems facing young people and families, but then moving to evaluating new interventions and then also keeping on moving things through so that we can actually ultimately disseminate interventions that have a chance of actually changing clinical practice. And these are the two numbers that we're trying to beat. Now, these numbers may be familiar to some of you, but 17 is the average number of years that it takes for research to make it into clinical practice. And that's mental health research as well as medical and, and clinical research. And 14 is the average number, as, uh, 14% is the, the average amount of research that actually makes it that far. So this is a real gap in terms of the research that we're doing actually having an impact in the real world on, on families and young people. So this is something we're quite passionate about changing. Um, and, and really, our work is, is trying to kind of span that translational trajectory and, and kind of move through the pipeline. So the first project that I'd love to talk to you about is Recapture Life and this has been a bit of a, a baby of mine for a number of years now and this is the idea of partnering with well we're now at the stage of partnering with community organisations to deliver online support to adolescent young adult cancer survivors and this is targeting that point after cancer treatment's finished and as I mentioned before we know that a number of challenges can arise in survivorship, whether that's um, you know, medical late effects, but particularly also psychosocial late effects and psychosocial distress or psychological distress. Um, you know, I think one of the things that we've documented in a lot of our research is that the point of ca finishing cancer treatment is amazing from a lot of perspectives. It's a huge relief to young people and families that it's over. They can sort of return back to normal. But it's that point of returning back to normal that can bring up a whole number of new challenges. Returning to school, returning to uni, trying to reconnect with old friends, reintegrate back into communities. So what we've found in our research and what I also see clinically with the young people that I work with is that that point of finishing treatment can be a time of mixed emotions and it can also be a time where young people and families can grapple with how do I do this? How do I return to normal? You know, is normal even the same anymore? And this is also the time where young people and their families have left the hospital. So they're not seeing the hospital teams who were their kind of solid supports for however many months previously. They're not seeing those people anymore. So how do we help these families at this time point? And how do we help them in the Australian context, which is a very unique context to be working in? So we have the lowest population density in the developed world. And as you can see here, we have far fewer people than we do kangaroos and sheep. So what all of that means is that, you know, we really need to think about how we deliver services. So is it feasible to be trying to deliver face-to-face -face services on a large scale? And we decided in our group a long time ago that we didn't think it was, at least in the survivorship context. Um, so we thought, you know, maybe it's time for us to be looking online. 
So a number of years ago, we developed Recapture Life, and this was originally funded by a project from Cancer Australia and Beyond Blue with a wonderful team of um, Australian collaborators. And this was really designed to assist young people to develop coping strategies to help them adjust in the early phase of survivorship um, and, and also kind of move on, um, integrate their cancer experience and move on to life after cancer. And so we developed this to be something that we could deliver to young people, ideally in the first year after cancer treatment, because we figured that was a time where they were still adjusting back to normal lives um, and, and not quite on the other side of cancer just yet. And we developed it to be a group-based program, partly because um, from a feasibility perspective, you can deliver you know, an intervention to multiple people at the same time. But the main reason was actually because we know that young people really crave and thrive that peer connection. So many young people won't necessarily meet another person their age who's gone through this, you know, cancer treatment like they have. Even where I work at Sydney Youth Cancer Service, we're working with lots of young people at the same time. But logistically, you know, whether they all cross paths with each other, it's still very random. So we developed this to be an online program using video conferencing. So it's, we didn't use Skype, but it's a little bit like a group Skype, if you can imagine that. So an online virtual pro, um, group led by a psychologist. And we designed to have six 90-minute weekly sessions paired with a, a psychoeducational workbook. So each of the sessions um, you know, had um, a number of skills in it that we were trying to teach, as well as just a discussion around the topic for the week. So this is what the workbook looked like. Um, it had psychoeducation that mirrored what we were talking about in the sessions, as well as quotes throughout that were real quotes from young people who'd been through cancer. Um, and this is an overview of what the program looked like. So this was... Um, not intended to reinvent the wheel really in any way. We were taking evidence-based strategies from cognitive and behavioral therapies and applying that to the topics that we knew were frequent topics of concern for young people after cancer treatment. So each session had a, a kind of a topic, a cancer-related topic, and then also a set of skills that was designed to help them manage that or, or sort of approach managing that topic. Um, so, you know, for example, the first session we kind of talked about what's just happened, you know, just talking about processing the experience. I had a lot of psychoeducation about emotions, but also just a lot of normalisation about common experiences. Um, and that's kind of what that, um, that workbook section looked like. We kind of introduced the ABC model to help young people pick apart their thoughts and feelings and how they were responding to their cancer experiences. Um, the second session, sort of looking at how's it impacted your life and your hobbies and your lifestyle and your, what you do. Again, um, not reinventing the wheel, drawing very much from evidence-based psychology strategies around getting back to activities and behavioural activation. Um, and so we kind of talk about this kind of vicious cycle that can happen between, you know, getting out of the, out of the habit of doing activities or not being able to do your hobbies while you're on cancer treatment, you know, maybe feeling less motivated, less energy, lower mood, they're not feeling like doing things. And then because you don't feel like doing things, you don't do things and then you feel worse and the cycle continues. So it's the inactivity trap that can come up. Um, another really key session that was often really, um, really resonated with the young people was a session around social support. Um, and that was really, um, you know, I don't think any, I don't think there would have been a single young person who participated in the program who didn't have some kind of story about friends dropping off the radar or having friends say the wrong thing or not knowing how to talk to their friends about what they were going through. And so really just breaking down some pretty um, useful fundamental social skills for grappling with some of those difficult conversations. Um, and helping them work through that. And this is a nice example of an exercise that we got them to do after that session, which is sort of um, a little experiment in a way to get them to try out having a particular conversation with a friend to test out how it goes. Because a lot of the time when we're worried about social situations, we're worried about how someone's going to react, what's going to happen if I say this, what's going to happen if I bring up that. And, and oftentimes the worries that we have in our heads are worse than what actually happens. So the, the, the exercise is really to just... Give something a go, test it out, and also watch what happens. You know, track later on, did that thing actually happen? And through the, that kind of process of experimentation, the idea is to give young people a bit of confidence in being able to raise those issues with friends later on and, and seek out the support they need. So the work that we've been doing over the past several years has really been to evaluate this program, particularly around feasibility, acceptability and safety. And we did this in the context of a, a three-armed uh, trial, a randomised trial, um, where we recruited across sites across Australia. 
And um, we recently published the, the kind of feasibility data on this trial and we had 67 participants from across five states, which was really great. Um, and on average, they lived 86 kilometres from their nearest capital city, but you can see up to 429 kilometres. So we did have some young people who were living quite remotely. And I remember uh, one of the groups that I led had a young person in New South Wales, Victoria and WA all dialing in at the same time. So it was nice to be able to connect those people in that way. So over the course of that trial, we conducted 95 online therapeutic sessions, totaling about 104 clinical hours. Um, and an interesting note about the feasibility of that was that 60 of those sessions, so approximately 90 hours of clinical time, occurred out of office hours, so out, out of the hours of sort of 9 to 5, Monday to Friday kind of thing. So that was an important thing for us to track when we're thinking about how doable would this be within a kind of normal public health setting. So anyway, that was interesting to track. Um, so... So we looked at all different aspects of how the program worked. And one of the first things we looked at was session attendance. And so of the, the young people, the adolescents and young adults who, who chose to do Recapture Life, 92% of them did complete it. So once they were in the program, they did remain quite engaged. And 75% of them attended at least five out of the six sessions. Um, and, you know, on average, they logged on pretty quickly. So there was a median of four minutes for the whole group to be kind of set up for the week and good to go. We looked at access as well, because that's one of the questions when you're doing online support, you know, how many people are going to be able to access this? Um, and we found that 80% of the young people did already have all the tech equipment and things they would have needed to take part. Uh, we had funding built into the grant to be able to help help out with internet or help out with, you know, an iPad or things if they didn't have that, but it, it wasn't needed for the majority, which was interesting. We also looked at technological difficulties, which is so important and also um, I think one of the biggest barriers to rolling out interventions like this, particularly from a clinician perspective. So I think there's sort of data to show that oftentimes counsellors, psychologists, clinicians can be quite hesitant to go to the online space because of worries about many things, including how am I going to manage manage it if it all doesn't work and there's technological difficulties and you know what we did experience technological difficulties in about 71 percent of our sessions so most of the time um, it happened on average you know we lost about six minutes so this was the, the therapist facilitators logging each session what happened um, but the impact was low so we not only logged did it happen and how long did it take to resolve but you know what impact did it have on your ability to actually deliver the group um, and we rated that on a 10 point scale and and look the mean rating was two out of 10 if 10 was the worst possible rating and zero was none so what we found was that it happened and it was a bit of a disruption but it didn't really impede our ability to facilitate the group deliver the content all of those sorts of things um, you know and and our impressions as facilitators was that it probably bothered us more than it bothered the young people. They kind of weren't that phased. Um, and in terms of what it was, it was mostly things like webcam freezes, you know, someone's audio dropping out temporarily, the same sorts of things that we've all experienced on Skype before. Um, yeah, so it wasn't too prohibitive. Um, we also documented the safety of the group, which I think is an important thing for online and digital research to be, or digital interventions to be doing, because there is always a question of how appropriate is it for us to be intervening in the online space? How appropriate is it for us to be managing and supporting potentially distressed young people in a group context in the online environment? So we had quite rigorous... I suppose, clinical protocols around how we would be assessing distress on a regular basis, what we would consider to be high distress that would need an extra check, how we would check that up and so forth. Um, so overall, so we, we considered it clinically concerning if their distress jumped by three points on the distress thermometer from one week to the next, or if it was above the 7 out of 10. So that was our threshold. And so 21 of our AYAs um, on 40 different occasions did pop up with some kind of clinically dis uh, clinically concerning distress score. Um, we were able to reach them all within 48 hours to, con to check, check up on them and see how they're going. None of them had what we would call kind of acute mental health risks where their, their safety was at risk. They were, you know, experiencing, um, you know, su active suicidality that time type of things so we're able to ensure their safety um, and 60 percent of them return to non-clinically concerning distress scores by the next session so I thought that was quite reassuring from a safety perspective 
And from a qualitative perspective, the young people really liked the program. So um, it didn't surprise us that the, the peer element was really important. Um, you know, this person said it helped me pick apart confusing feelings I was having and sort them out in my mind. One of the most powerful things was often just knowing that it's okay to think these things. It's okay to feel a bit funny after you finish cancer treatment. For young people, even the idea that it's okay not to be bouncing off the, you know, off the top of the world after you finish cancer treatment, even that's a bit relieving to know it's okay to feel a bit funny and mixed. Um, this person said it gave me confidence to approach difficult aspects of my life, for example, telling friends that I've had cancer without getting upset whilst telling them about my experience, um, you know, to know I wasn't the only one feeling a certain way, talking to other people my age was great, and just to feel more normal and to laugh about things, you know, that common shared experience. We really have also tried to use our study to kind of unpick how programs like this might work so that we can then take that into the real world and, and to really look at processes about, um, you know, opening the black box for an in online intervention, seeing what works, what maybe doesn't work, and how does this Im impact on how we could do this in the real world, maybe outside of an academic setting. So one of the things that we've looked at is actually clinical processes like therapeutic alliance, which is essentially a fancy way to say the young person's connection and their rapport with the facilitator running the program, and also group cohesion. So how well did the group kind of gel and, and kind of connect together as a group? Um, and so what we found was that young people rated good rapport. So, um, so with this graph over here, this one's worded negatively. So the first item is that they whether they thought the group leader didn't um, uh, understand their needs. So they're not rating highly on that, but they said they felt confident the group leader's ability to help. They, they felt the group leader appreciated them and they felt the approach to working with their concerns was a good approach. Um, and then with the group cohesion, this is again, they felt accepted and respected. The group held them to understand their concerns. And, and these um, items are sort of about um, and the negatively worded ones. So they, they weren't thinking that it wasn't the right way to get help or that they kind of kept things to themselves. And so that was something that we wanted to be able to report on so that other people could be able to build that into their online interventions as well. Um, so, for example, this is, this, these numbers are basically showing that the young people over time rated quite highly um, their perceptions of the therapist delight, so their connection with the therapist. And it didn't change. Basically, all these numbers are showing is that it didn't change significantly from the start to the end of the intervention. So they started out feeling good about that connection with the therapist, and they still felt good about it at the end of the intervention. Interestingly, the therapist ratings worked a bit differently. So we got the therapist to rate after each session, you know, their comfort with running the group, um, the rapport within the group, the openness of the participants, trust, the peer-to-peer -peer communication, a number of those things. And it was high at both the start and the end of the group. Um, but what we noticed was that there were a couple of items related to rapport and openness of the group and the motivation of the participants that just increased a little bit over the course of the online intervention. So the therapist felt a little bit better about that at the end of the intervention than they had at the start. And so we, thinking about this, we kind of felt like this might have been related to the therapists, the facilitators, just gaining their own confidence in running the group over time, that it, you know, by the end of the group they were feeling more positively about how it all went. Um, yeah, so that was an interesting thing to note. Um, we also have tried to document, so that, that clinically concerning distress stuff that I talked about before, we tried to really document how that played out and how we managed it um, for, to help hopefully other people who want to be able to do online interventions. When I've been reading into this space, one thing that I found challenging, particularly in the early stages when we were trying to develop this program, was there were lots of studies talking about pilot programs and there were lots of studies trying to report on efficacy and, you know, do they work? Um, but there weren't many studies that kind of picked apart the, the how question, how does this work and how do you do this? And one of the things that was very rarely discussed was how do you manage distress or tricky clinical situations in an online intervention? You kind of had to reach out to the individual investigators to find out, you know, what did you do in your work? So we um, wanted to publish on this so that other people could be able to look at what we did and, you know, maybe use some of the strategies themselves. So this was drawing on our kind of risk management protocol. And one of the things that we documented was that um, so clinical or ethical kind of 
ethically concerning issues arose in among 3 to 14% of participants. When you looked at any kind of point along the, the trial or any point along the program, it happened, you know, at, at different time points, at different amounts. And so, um, but most of them were detected through our routine checks that we had in place, which was really encouraging. And so there were kind of four key themes that came out as, as things that repeatedly we had to kind of grapple with when doing this online intervention. So one of them was this idea of managing mental health risks without face-to-face -face contact, which is similar to what I was saying before. How do we appropriately manage a young person who's distressed when we're not with them face-to-face? -face? And so a good example of that was an intake um, that I did with a young person who actually was reporting active current suicidality. And I'd not met her before and she'd not enrolled in the program yet. So it was like, how do we go about liaising with her GP and like liaising with relevant health um, services. I think she was from northern New South Wales or something, so she wasn't in Sydney either. So how do we do that liaising process to make sure she's safe, excuse me, um, without her being physically with us at the time? A second key theme that came out in terms of safety management was how do we facilitate talking about cancer-related experiences, which could be upsetting, could be distressing for some people, in a group setting? And so the group context is often used in the cancer space. Everyone's heard of cancer support groups. But, you know, the, the thing with that is that one person's experience is going to be different to another person's experience. And, you know, talking about those experiences in a group setting, there's a consideration about keeping everyone safe and keeping everyone supported so that one person isn't quietly just getting more and more distressed by hearing all of those experiences. So how do we facilitate that safely? Um, how do we respond appropriately to participants' health changes during the trial? So I was a little naive way back when, when we d developed this program, and I thought, oh, survivorship, you know, we're dealing with life after cancer. But survivorship looks very, very different for different people, and depending on the cancer they've had, depending on the treatment they've had, that first year can actually be quite a time of risk for the cancer popping back up again, or for at least having a relapse scare. And we did actually find that six of our young people did have cancer relapses um, at some point in their involvement in our trial. Um, only one of ours, only one of those happened while they were actively involved in a week-to-week -week group. And so we had to kind of develop protocols around how do we withdraw them from the group because they've got to go have more cancer treatment now. So how do we withdraw them in a way that's supportive for them and safe for them safe and supportive for the other people in the group and kind of just considering all the different players involved in that complex situation. Um, and the last thing that we had to really consider was just being mindful of the range of survivorship experiences and, and outlooks. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, I had a group where one young person was saying that cancer was the best thing that ever happened to them and they wouldn't change it for the world in terms of the person that they were now and, you know, how that had changed them. Um, and, and then, you know, other people in the group who would be really struggling and potentially depressed and, and just not having a good time. And, you know, both perspectives are valid. But how do we juggle that and how do we sensitively approach that in the group setting? And I think that these are probably issues that come up all the time in peer-led you know, cancer support groups in the community, um, but possibly haven't just been reported on or, or written about before. I don't know. So it was interesting. So we're now at this stage with Recapture Life where we're so um, fortunate to be working with a couple of community partners to be able to um, develop a community-based version of the program so we can roll it out to young people more broadly outside of the hospital sector. Um, and, and why are we doing this? Well, there's a number of reasons. One is to leverage the benefits and the real um, the resources that we have with our community partners. So one of the things is that there's still a lot of stigma around mental health and mental health help seeking, particularly around young people. Um, but there's a lot of trust with community organisations as well. They're, they're kind of names and brands and, and kind of almost characters that the patients and communities do trust and, and rely on. And so I think there's, there's opportunities there for those community organisations to provide a link with support that might be less threatening for people to be able to, to reach out for. And I would honestly say as well that I think currently there's greater experience and capacity for online interventions to be delivered in the NGO sector currently than in sort of public health or hospital settings. Um, you know, it's, it's really common now for, for organisations like Canteen, Cancer Council New South Wales, I'm sure probably Cancer Council across the country having online platforms for that kind of support. Um, 
And whereas in, in hospital settings, in kind of public health settings, there's not that kind of capacity or experience there. Another reason is that there's also just a lack of capacity in the, in the public health sector. So there's um, about seven kind of AYA specialist um, psychologists situated in hospitals across Australia at the moment, of which I'm one. Um, and, you know, and so looking at how we how feasible that is to work with those psychologists you know do they have the capacity to be delivering groups like this for survivors um you know and and looking at our original trial the timeline from originally developing the intervention through to running our last group was sort of 2011 to 2017 so it was quite a slow burn um so potentially you know harnessing um collaborations with the community could help that so this is just a map of that AYA psychology workforce. This doesn't represent the numbers, but simply the locations. And so you can see we're mainly situated around cities and, and we're, not, we're not everywhere. Um, so, yeah, and I don't think there's a, a youth cancer services specific psychologist in WA currently, unfortunately. So, so this is all about translating evidence into practice at the end of the day. So our community partnerships are really designed to assess the outcomes of, you know, how useful is this intervention in a community setting? So looking at feasibility, acceptability, efficacy, does it help improve outcomes? But particularly, we're also interested in the implementation processes. So how how does it work training up partners in community organisations to be able to deliver these manualised interventions? Um, you know, do they take up the training? What's the engagement like? You know, how does the organisation at all different levels feel about the programs and how it fits with their goals? Um, you know, what are the barriers and facilitators to delivering these programs in the community? How many of their consumers and young people are we able to reach? So we're working with Canteen on, on the one hand to be able to roll out Recapture Life. And so I'm sure everyone here may be familiar with Canteen, but for anyone who's not, Canteen's the national organisation for young people living with cancer. So they work with 12 to 25-year-olds who have cancer, have had cancer, or had a brother and sister with cancer. They also work with offspring. And they do a lot of different things, but they have increased a lot of online services recently as well. And so with our collaboration with them, it's similar to what we were doing in the trial. 15 to 25-year-olds can be able to participate. They don't actually have to be a member of Canteen to be eligible for the group program. Um, and, you know, it's, um, they don't have to have a, a computer and stuff like that, but it's because um, we have some funds to be able to facilitate that if they don't. So... So far with Canteen, we've completed five training sessions with them. So that's working directly with their counselling team to train them in the manualised intervention to then for them to then be able to deliver it. Um, one of those was planning and four of those were experiential training sessions. So we went, ran one group last year with two young people. We had a few dropouts due to young people's sort of competing schedules and things. We just finished, well, Canteen just finished one other group this week. They had five young people involved and we're just putting together the next group that's going to start in November as well and so I suppose again it's a bit of a um, I guess a slow process in getting the groups together so we cast a wide net to all of the canteen consumers which is about 1200 young people but of those young people we think maybe only 89 were actually young people who'd finished cancer treatment who might be eligible um, you know so there's a lot of different routes of distribution through Facebook groups flyers you know all of those sorts of things um, and this is what the process looks like in terms of how we share all that stuff with the community organisation. So, um, you know, we're doing some of it and Canteen's doing some of it, essentially. So we, you know, the young person expresses their interest to Canteen, then we kind of send out the study details, then Canteen does the intake interview, you know, we send out the questions. So we're kind of managing the research side of it, essentially. Um, except Canteen's a little unique because they actually do have their own internal research team. So they've kind of been helping out more recently with the kind of intake and consenting processes because that kind of seemed to work a bit more in a more of a streamlined way. And recently we started working with Cancer Council New South Wales as well, which is a very exciting new partnership. Um, and this came about because, and I suppose from my clinical position as well, I see that 
you know, the, the young adult cancer service is kind of cut off at about 25. So if you're 26, 27, 32, you know, you might still have a lot of unique needs but not be able to access those adolescent young adult specialist services. Um, so, you know, we know that young people in those ages as well can still be at risk for heightened distress and there are still developmental challenges. They're different. They're probably more to do with career, relationships, fertility, having kids, having young families, um, but they're still there. And, you know, there aren't too many evidence-based support programs to fill that gap. So with Cancer Council New South Wales, we've actually been working to tailor the Recapture Life program to that slightly older age group, um, 25 to 40 years. Um, and we've started training them, or we've actually done two trainings with four Cancer Council New South Wales counselling staff um, and really working with them to tailor the program to be something that works with them as an organisation. So one of the things that this resulted in was just rebranding it um, to Reclaim Life. That was a, a, a name that they liked better or, or felt more comfortable with. We rebranded it to be consistent with Cancer Council kind of branding so that they would feel comfortable um, sharing that and, and having that as part of their suite of services. Um, and, and that was exciting to us because the whole point of doing a partnership and an implementation project is you know we don't want to be precious about our thing and you know not change anything about it it's actually important to us that we can adapt it so that it is something that the organization feels excited about and feels comfortable you know sharing and disseminating and so we've just been starting recruitment for the cancer council groups um, just this past month actually so we're in the process of putting a group together for them um, and we're also asking the team at, at various different time points how they're feeling about the program um, because that's one of the implementation outcomes is, I suppose, you know, how they're feeling about the program over time and, and that can feed into later on seeing whether there were barriers or facilitators in rolling it out. And so at each training, at each meeting, we kind of ask them about their confidence delivering the program and their attitudes towards the program and that's kind of gone up over time um, with our different meetings. And we also had an opportunity to present to Cancer Council New South Wales as a, as a kind of a whole organisation recently. And that was really exciting because it's quite important to us to gauge how the organisation is feeling about it at multiple different levels. Um, there was, you know, counsellors, there was program coordinators, media, admin, research staff. Um, and overall, they were feeling quite positively about the program. I was excited to see that they felt it fit well with their survivorship programs and that it fit with their kind of strategic intent to improve quality of life and of course there were some concerns about IT and staffing as potential barriers and and we'd sort of expect that so that's why it's really important that we track that and monitor that and the impact of it over time. So I'm conscious of time so I won't spend too much on this but I did want to flag our other kind of online intervention which is sort of a sister program to the Recapture Life program and that's the, the Cascade program for parents of kids and adolescents who finish cancer treatment. So it's similar to Recapture Life, except it's a four-session program, and that was partly because we found in the development of it in the pilot that parents are just busy people, and the idea of trying to get them to sign up for six sessions just wasn't feasible. Um, but it's a similar thing. It's an online group program with a workbook alongside, and so you can see a similar, a similar kind of program in terms of talking about cancer impact and having some coping strategies to manage it. Um, and, you know, in our trial of the feasib feasibility trial of the program, we found um, similar to the Recapture Life that a lot of the, um, uh, so it was mostly mums who took part, mothers, and on average they did live quite a distance away from the hospital as well. Um, and mostly kind of their child was a first time um, cancer patient, so hadn't relapsed. Um, and similar outcomes to Recapture Life in terms of the feasibility. So opt-in wasn't as high as we would have liked, but that's kind of a common theme for a lot of um, psychological interventions. But encouragingly, once they did opt in and start taking part, the enrolment and the, the completion was really quite high as well. Um, and these are just some stats on the, the feasibility of delivering it. Uh, this wasn't something that I highlighted in the Recapture Life stats, but just a note, and I'm happy to chat to anyone about this. Um, it takes a really long time to form groups for group programs and particularly online groups. So there's a lot of logistics involved in that. So it can take a little while to get a group together. Um, but we, they delivered 47 sessions, um, on average, you know, 90 minutes a session, and logons were really quick. Similar story in terms of technical disruptions. 
you know, in the Cascade delivery, we had it happen on 66% of the sessions, so slightly better than Recapture Life, but not much. Um, but again, the story is the same in terms of it having a low impact. So this is the 10-point scale, and you can see most of the time it was like a one or a two on the impact. And I think, honestly, I don't know, NBN rollouts happening and I think it's just a story with the Australian internet so it was interesting when we were writing up our feasibility paper looking at other online interventions and how they'd written up their findings and depending on where the intervention took place some interventions like in the US or places were reporting that technological difficulties sort of rarely happened and weren't an issue so maybe it's just a geographical thing. Um, similar thing in terms of session set attendance. There was a little bit of a decline over time. It wasn't significant, but overall, it was sort of above 70 75% attendance across all of the sessions for the parent group. Um, and in terms of benefit and burden, there was a low burden and a high benefit of the group for parents. And that's an important thing for us to be tracking in terms of the acceptability. Um, yeah, so this is therapeutic alliance. So again, the sense of to what extent they connected with the, the psychologist leading the group. And this is just divided between Cascade and the peer support control, but it was pretty high across both groups. Um, they felt quite good about that connection. And again, the safety data from Cascade mirrors what we saw in the Recapture Life um, program. So those are the emotion thermometer scores and over time, so from week one through to week four. And you can see they fluctuate a little bit um, over time, but actually um, it's the line of four is normally considered clinically concerning. So it wasn't often that they kind of dipped in that clinically concerning region on a group basis. And, um, you know, they kind of didn't go up over time, which is good. Qualitatively as well, parents really enjoyed the program. And I think like... Recapture Life, one of the key benefits was um, the group connection as well. Um, but again, having the capacity, the time, the sort of supportive space to learn that it was okay to feel certain ways after your child's cancer treatment, um, you know, that there was reassurance and kind of time to unpack some of their feelings about it. Um, one, you know, I guess one of the interesting things was, and this relates to group based sessions, is it can have an impact hearing other people's experiences as well so this young this mum or this parent said I did worry about one of the members and her struggles but saw the change in her over time and felt like I'd seen something shift for her so it's nice to be part of that um, and you know it is it is burdensome doing a, a psychological program so we wouldn't deny that there is an impact there and, and that's always something we have to consider obviously our online model aims to reduce the burden they can do it from the comfort of their own home you know, often these programs were held like just after dinner time so a parent can hopefully have at least some of the kids to bed or whoever. So we tried to minimise the burden, but um, yeah. Uh, so overall it seemed sort of feasible, acceptable and safe um, and the therapeutic processes like in Recapture Life kind of translate well. We're still working on the further analysis to see, you know, what was the, what was the impact on quality of life. Um, and, and of course, you know, these are fairly small trials. Unfortunately in Australia we do, don't have the numbers um, that they have in the US to be able to conduct really large trials of these things. Um, so in terms of Cascade, the parent group, next steps for implementation. Well, we're working at the moment to refine the program to work with several community partners. So probably going to be starting with Canteen again. They've just recently launched a parent platform to support parents of, of teens um, with cancer. And we've also very excitingly been talking with research teams in New Zealand and Mexico who have reached out and they're quite interested to implement Cascade for overseas communities, um, which, which is exciting. And, and we're, again, really keen to work to adapt this where we can um, so it can be useful. Um, and we just recently submitted to UNSW Ethics for the implementation stage. So hopefully we'll be starting that in 2020 and overall just really keen to collaborate, tailor, adapt where we can. So I wanted to finish with a few reflections on our experiences working with the community so far because I think it's always such, well, it's been a big learning curve for me and so hopefully this can be useful. Um, but I think it's really beneficial to partner to then be able to offer Canteen and Cancer Council services to a broader community of, of young people. And I guess doing this work, we're hoping also to build and strengthen our connections with those wider community organisations as well. And I think there is potential 
really great benefit and opportunity in delivering programs like this through community organisations that have a really well-established name and community uh, name and reputation among cancer survivors. You know, it could potentially help to reduce help-seeking stigma and potentially extend the sustainability of evidence-based programs um, given resource constraints that we have in oncology. The, these projects do... You know, you have to build in a lot of time for iteration and time to reflect on the implementation and processes of implementation, a lot of time for consultation with the organisations to tailor what we're doing, check in and make sure it's going to work um, work well for them, uh, which is just part of the, the process. Um, but overall, we found it to be an enjoyable experience for staff and the survivors so far. So um, particularly, you know, having that space to explore their cancer experience um, has been a positive thing, Um, particularly... So this is probably more so from our experiences with Canteen so far because we haven't started those sessions with Cancer Council yet. Um, But like in the original trial, we find that the Canteen facilitators at times had to adapt content to suit the particular group, and that's just part of the clinical delivery of that program. So there are always challenges and lessons learned. So um, recruitment and retention is always a a tricky issue, particularly in adolescent and young adult research. They're a very keen group. Um, They'll often say that they want a lot of services, but actually getting them to participate is sometimes... another thing. So with Canteen, we had interest expressed by about 19 AYAs, um, adolescents and young adults so far, but then a lot of barriers come up. They're very busy with school and university and scheduling and things like that. Um, And sometimes the group can be difficult to engage. So um, a lot of the interested young people did have their own counsellors and psychologists already as well, which is fine. That didn't um, preclude them from participating in the program, but just meant they were juggling lots of other things. Um, And there's just process issues between collaborating parties. Um, You know, both my research team and the canteen team in particular um, have part-time staff members um, who are doing lots of different things, managing lots of different projects. And particularly um, the canteen team, they've had a lot of turnover in their counsellors. They often have a lot of psychologists in training, master's students who are kind of working there on a part-time basis. And so there's a lot of turnover inevitably when they get their full-time work and things like that. Um, So that's been a challenge kind of when we've delivered training and then needed to deliver it a few times to new staff members. Um, Interesting figuring out the process issues. For example, Canteen has their own research team, so it was just a juggle in terms of figuring out what's going to work best in terms of what we do and what you do and how that's going to work best. Um, And as with all of these sorts of collaborations, there's always a, um, a very legalistic document somewhere in in there that needs to be signed by all parties to make sure we're all kind of doing what we say we're going to do and, you know, adhering to, um, you know, the right things legally. So memorandums of understanding and things like that, um, you know, need to be developed just as par for the course. Um, And and that's just something that we have to factor in. Um, And also um, the social media and advertising stuff, which is very exciting. And, you know, we're very excited to to rebrand our intervention for Cancer Council New South Wales recently, but all of that takes time as well to be able to deliver and work with comms teams and marketing teams and things like that as well. So overall, um, online cognitive behavioural therapy for adolescents and young adults and parents can be helpful in improving their distress and certainly we've found in our trials so far that they're acceptable, feasible and and seem to be safe Um, and and also to the therapists as well. It seems to be an acceptable model for care. Um, And we can monitor young people and families' distress remotely in these online programs, but you do need to have really good distress monitoring procedures in place. Um, Tricky clinical and process issues can arise, for sure. So this is something that we learned that you have to plan ahead and you have to have good supervision in place. And that's something that we continue to have in our implementation programs or implementation trials is we have kind of semi-regular supervision with the canteen counsellors and with the cancer council counsellors who are doing the program so they can have an extra space to be able to debrief what's happened in the groups. So Recapture Life or Reclaim Life is now available in the community for young people who've had cancer and Cascade is hopefully soon to follow. So I just need to finish up with a huge thank you to the broader research team from the Behavioural Sciences Unit, particularly Professor Claire Wakefield, to our broader National Recapture Life Working Party um, across Australia. And I just want to... 
make a, a big thank you as well to our canteen partners and our Cancer Council New South Wales partners who have been really fundamental in helping us develop this work and take it to the next stage as well. And thank you to all of our wonderful funders and I'd be really happy to open up for any questions now and thank you for your time. I think I've got the roving mic, but we, we are over time and I understand we just started a bit late, so if people need to leave, that's fine. But if anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask Ursula, we can certainly do that. I'm actually just about to hand in my honours thesis on Friday next week, which is on mothers of experience of cancer um, post-treatment and how they deal with that. Um, I found in my interviews, it was a qualitative interview, that uh, that media end, you know, that bit at the end is actually, most of them didn't talk about feelings of celebration or relief, it was just shock and fear, um, very strong connection to the hospital. With any of these programs, do you work with the hospital so that they can sort of be given a packet, what I think will what my recommendation and my thesis is going to be, there needs to be a very clear end of treatment package that gives them the, the, the services you can go find and access. Is there any way that at the end of treatment they get given this information so they can be guided rather than left sort of floundering, if you know what I mean? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. So mothers of mothers who had can, cats, uh, mothers of children with cancer. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's a real issue. Um, so in our original trial, that feasibility trial, we were actually recruiting directly through the clinics. And so it was actually through doctors and things that were getting this information. Um, you know, we haven't developed any kind of systematic way of them getting this information. Um, and I think it's quite variable as well. Like, so with a lot of our participants who took part in Cascade, we had some who took part, you know, a couple of years on and would say oh, you know, this would have been really great, like just when, I, when he was on treatment or just after he finished cancer treatment, things like that. But then our experience has also been that the, the families who his kid has just finished treatment just can't, often can't manage it at that time. And there's been other data from the States. I was just reading a paper yesterday where they tried to implement a, a kind of a, a supportive program for parents after their child was newly diagnosed because that can often be a time of crisis as well but the, the challenges for families in actually having the capacity time and also just, just the mental capacity for it at that time is really hard. So I don't have a perfect answer. I think that it would be ideal for families to get information systematically. Even if they didn't have the energy to deal with it in that six weeks, three months, five months time frame knowing it was there sometimes it was the fear of knowing there was no one there to support them or feeling like there was yeah and a lot of most my participants said that the phone services that are available don't work for them They're yeah picking up the phone and talking to someone who they don't know over the phone yeah that's yeah. normally is the thing that sort of told them to bring up this number doesn't work for them but i think sometimes the knowing information is there it's that lack of yeah certain, you know they've just come out of a very uncertain time and then knowing there was something they could access yeah. later down the track. I, I think that's a great suggestion. I, I suspect that in those kind of finishing up treatment appointments, it's probably often going to be the case that the doctors just have so much that they need to address with the families in terms of subsequent medical surveillance and medical follow-up. Probably it would work better for us to be able to work with social workers and things like that for them to be able to have a side conversation at that point and things like that. Um, yeah, but it's, it's a challenge, but an important consideration have any more questions? I, sorry. I just I wanted to ask, what, what happens, I don't know, I mean, you probably can't comment what happens here, but what happens um, in the eastern states, New South Wales, when, for example, if a child's diagnosed with cancer sort of pre-teen age and maybe goes through a successful treatment or something like that, and then they have some sort of relapse where they come back and they're still, like, they're maybe 18 now. Do they tend to go back to their original centre, like the paediatric centre? Or now is it like, well, you're 18 now, you go to an adult hospital? Because I can imagine, um, like, if you've gone through a journey as a paediatric patient, um, I mean, I worked for many years at Princess Margaret, um, sort of side-by-side side with the oncology department, and I know that, you know, there's really strong 
bonds and sort of not not dependencies that's not the right word but they're very close to their carers in a lot of ways and yeah do you have any comments about like whether patients when they relapse then just progress automatically to an adult hospital or is there some sort of process by which they can sort of be taken back into the fold or I'm not sure yeah um it's a really good question and unfortunately I think hospital systems just due to bed numbers and things like that don't tend to work with that um frame in mind so the short answer is I think a young person there are gray zones and so certainly we have patients who are sort of 16 17 maybe occasionally 18 but mainly more that 16 17 mark where we might negotiate that they be treated in the pediatric setting if it's going to be beneficial for example there's a trial they can access that they couldn't access next door in adults or things like that but I'd say generally speaking an 18 year old is heading over to the adults if they have been, if their initial cancer was at a time where they were working with adolescent, young adult, like youth cancer services people, then we would hopefully be a, p- a point of consistency for them. So the same clinical nurse consultants would be able to see them in the adult setting. I would be able to see them again, for instance, if it was one of our patients. But yeah, if it was a young person who was treated at 10 years old and has now relapsed at 18, yeah, there's not going to be that much consistency there, which is a real challenge. I think transition is is one of the biggest challenges that we still don't do very well um, for that, those kind of teens graduating into the adult sector. Yeah. I think we might leave it now for the questions. Thank you so much for being here today. Please do fill in your evaluation form. It really does help us out. And please visit our website if you'd like to know other Cancer Update topics that are coming uh, in the next 12 months we, we try and plan ahead and have the dates up at least if we don't have the speakers and don't forget if you know people who you think would really like to have heard today we will have a link available also um, for you to use but our website you can go and visit there as well and see the audio and the slides from today's presentation so once again please join me in thanking Dr Ursula Sanson Daly.